Well, here we go. I'll try to uh, build on what, on what Dominique just said so well, and uh, maybe uh, carry a little bit further. Quite a few years ago now, I was attending a, uh, a Bible study, or actually a prayer meeting, in a, a very large church in downtown Boston. And at the end of the prayer meeting, a, a lady in the uh, congregation uh, came up to talk to me. <clears throat> now why she came to talk to me in particular, I don't know, because I wasn't leading the meeting at all. But uh, for some reason she came up to talk to me. And she was telling me about uh, the apartment building in which she lived. And particularly about one gentleman in the building who was rather troubled and troubling. As you know, sometimes people who are troubled are also troubling. And uh, this gentleman had, you know, a variety of issues and some health problems as well. <clears throat> and she said, uh, so we, t we talked for a while and and finally, um, I asked if I could pray with him, and that was agreeable to him. So I, I just uh, briefly prayed for him. And in fact, I spent a lot of my time at home uh, praying for all my neighbors in the building. Because in fact, that's about all I can do. I don't have any resources to speak of, I can leave home and, you know, go about the city on foot or by, by subway, maybe, but um, I'm just really pretty much at home and have no resources, and so I can't do a thing for anybody except pray. I'm so useless. And I did suggest to her that uh, no one who prays is useless. No one who prays is ever useless. And, and so I, I do hope that perhaps she left that day feeling a bit better about herself. But in a way, that's what Paul was getting at as well. You may feel as if you don't have the resources or the ability to do anything for anybody except pray. And yet, when you pray, you've already done the most important thing to begin. It's the most important thing right off the bat. Now that doesn't mean that uh, follow-up shouldn't come. If, if we're able to follow up our prayer with some kind of action or assistance, that's so much the better. In fact, uh, James, the uh, apostle and brother of the Lord, or maybe not, because his book doesn't really tell us anything about him, just his name, James. So it could have been the, Lord, the Lord's brother, or somebody else named James. We just don't know. But at one point, James, in the second chapter of his letter, made this statement. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. And so the fact is that when we pray, we've already done the very best thing that we can possibly do. That's the way to start. 
And if that's all you're able to do, it's also a good way to end. But if you have the strength or the resources or the time or the ability to do something further, then as a matter of fact, that is exactly what we are required to do. Because as James put it in another place, faith without action is dead. Faith is good. Faith, in fact, does save. But if it has no action, it's really kind of void. So if you can follow up, you follow up. And as Dominique put it so well, this follow-up requires all of us. If you can pray, somebody else in the church can prepare a meal and bring it. Maybe you can, but somebody else can. So you pray and they cook while they're praying. So we need each other, exactly as Dominique put it. Now when Paul was speaking of the body of Christ, there were several issues that he was trying to raise. One was the issue of what you could call complexes. On the one side, inferiority complex, and on the other side, superiority complex. And so he spoke of the ear. <clears throat> he spoke of the ear saying, because I'm just a poor ear, I'm not really part of the body. All I can do is stay in one place, right where I'm fixed onto the head, and pick up vibrations from the outside world, which I then have to shoot onto the brain for interpretation. So, poor ear, I'm really a slug. And I'm not really even part of the body, poor me. But then Paul went on to say that the eye, for example, cannot say to the foot, because I'm a glorious, beautiful eye, blue or green or brown or whatever, and because I can move all around and, you know, up and down, do all kinds of cool things, <coughs> because I'm so great like that, you foot, I could really get along without you. And the brain could say the same thing, of course. The brain, of course, could be the, have the worst inferior, the superiority complex of all. You know, I'm the brain of this operation. I made the whole thing work. And foot without you, I'd figure out another way to get one going. And that's, you know, partially true. Our brains are very adaptable. And our brains can figure out a lot of plan Bs, or even plan Cs, you know. Um, for many years now, I've been afflicted with a right eye that doesn't do much of anything. And the result, of course, is that for all practical purposes, I, I have no depth perception. But you know, the funny thing is, I don't walk into things. I don't knock things off of tables. I don't run into people. Somehow, over a, a course of time, a period of years, my brain has learned how to figure out where I am and where everything else is, even without depth perception. <clears throat> now how that can be, I don't know. But my brain has figured out where I am and where you are. It, it's kind of an amazing thing, really. 
But nevertheless, <coughs> in the last analysis, even the brain can't say, I can do it all myself. Now just imagine a worship service to which nobody showed up but the preacher. It wouldn't be much of a service. Or if nobody showed up but the uh, pianist, it wouldn't be much of a service. To have a service of worship to praise and glorify God, you need everybody. You need the whole church to come together. And so we need each other. And everyone, every one of you is useful. You may not even see it. You might say to yourself, what use am I? Well, if you feel that way, stop it. <laughs> really, just, just stop it, please. And don't feel that way when you leave. Because you're important. And don't ever think you can do everything on your own either. Don't, I mean, don't go to the other extreme and say, well, I'm so brilliant. I can, I can change the world without any help whatsoever. Uh, that, that's a sure way to, to have a great downfall. And Paul was also at, at pains to say in this lesson, not only do we need each other, but we need to value each other. We need to have mutual care and concern for each other. And that's true in any kind of social unit, isn't it? Whether it's a family or a church, which is in fact an extended family, or even for that matter a whole nation. On a grand scale, even in a whole nation, we have to care for one another. As Paul put it, we have to bear one another's burdens. And today we're thinking, talking primarily about the church, because that's what Paul was talking about in Scripture. And we're gathered together here as the church, so. Today, we're basically dealing with the church, which is, however, an extended family, which is partly what makes the church so messy, of course. Um, you've all had the experience of family. At least we all grew up in a family, and probably have had family experience beyond that. And we know that families can be very messy. And that's why the church can also be so very messy at times, because we're an extended family. Now, back in the day, when we tended to, in some respects, devalue the church, there were folks who said, there was one per person in particular who then was, you know, I don't know who it was, but one person who said and then was quoted over and over again, to prove some kind of a very fancy point, I guess. That uh, I, I love Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus was a great teacher, a great person. And if we all lived as Jesus taught, if we all followed Jesus, the world would be a great place. And so I really love Jesus. It's his kids I can't stand. <laughs> And by that reaction, I can tell that you've all had some experience with Jesus' kids. <laughs> but you know, here's the thing. If you're like me, and we're all pretty much alike, really. If you're like me, there are certain people that you love to hang out with. And I have no trouble at all liking the people with whom I like to hang out. I have no problem with people I like. <clears throat> Fortunately for me, I like most people, so I, you know, I get along okay, but... Uh, 
People I like are fine, and I'd like to hang out with them. Um, it's the people that are troublesome to me that I kind of want to be on the other side of the room, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and you all, you all, you've all had that experience. Mm -hmm. There are kids you like, and there are kids you don't like. There are kids on the playground, you know, to use the analogy, kids on the playground that you would like to be on the other side of the playground because they're just such a pain, right? But what Paul is trying to get across about the body of Christ is that we have, in fact, a calling to approach and reach out to the kids we can't stand to the folks in the church who, if they, you know, stayed home, we would feel kind of comfortable. But that's, that's not good. That's really, really not good. We're called to relate to the ones we can't stand. To reach out to the ones who are obnoxious. They're the ones we're called to reach out to. They are the ones whose burdens we're called to, to bear. Now, Jesus told us to love our enemies. Did he not? Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. Jesus told us to love our enemies. Now, if, if I can't reach out and relate to and even love, brothers and sisters in the church with whom I disagree, how in God's name am I ever going to love my enemy? That's it, I'm finished. <laughs>